Welcome to my view from the piano bench. We do this on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. here on my Joe Holtz Notes YouTube channel in addition to Piano for My Friends on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Tonight I'm actually looking for my notes and realize that right now I'm not using them because I'm speaking extemporaneously uh, on a particular tune, but I'm getting ahead of myself for my, I do that all the time, by the way. Ahead of myself, beside myself, behind myself, and completely lost around and inside myself. Here's a good description. Anyway, uh, on Wednesday evenings for my view from the piano bench, I talk about experiences about playing or things about playing for musicians and non-musicians, hopefully. And past couple of weeks, I've talked about particular tunes, not as tutorials for the tunes, but uh, using the subject of the tune to talk about different things, including things about making music that hopefully musicians will find interesting. Thank you for those of you who support and encourage me via the means available on the support page of my website. You'll see a link to that in the video description below. Uh, that's much appreciated. Uh, and also, it's much appreciated that you're here. All right. So talking about particular tunes, when I did the first one, which was nice work if you can get it, uh, which came about just through a series of circumstances with people I was already interacting with, uh, I said, this is cool, this works. So I did Sweet Georgia Brown last week. So I had in mind to do As Time Goes By this week, because there are absolutely things to talk about in that tune. Uh, and then going forward, you know, from week to week, I may go back and forth between a tune or a topic that someone suggests or whatever. But I know where I am right now, and I'm, I know what I'm doing at this moment, which is more than I can uh, sometimes say. So we all know the tune. So let me just play the tune first, see if I'm in the space to play, which I really didn't check before I started. Not my best move.
go, a little as time goes by. Uh, and I didn't plan on it, it just happened, story of my everything, uh, that when I got to the end, I quoted a little bit of a tune, Tenderly. Uh, tenderly uh, is often played in the same key that As Time Goes By is often played in. Stock keys, we'll call them. Uh, and the go-to keys when you're doing tunes is instrumentals. When you're doing a tune behind a singer or with a vocalist, uh, all bets can be off as to what key it is. And that's one of the things that you know separates musicians uh, and, and the roles they play and the level they work at. Uh, like how versatile are they going to be with transposition, particularly a compass. You know, and I'm, I, I guess I'm in a scale of reasonably versatile, you know, not fully completely like, it's not all the, not the case of all 12 keys are just equal to me. Uh, and I would have to, for a long period of time, have focused practice to that end for that to be the case. Uh, but I, like many players, have keys I would prefer. Uh, and keys that I wouldn't prefer, like E, B, and F sharp. Uh, doesn't mean I can't play in them, and I do when I when I need to, and I need to work more on them. But the stock keys, particularly for standards, are orchestral keys. Uh, so when when you're hearing an older tune, you know, from the Big Band era or before, or Tin Pan Alley, uh, you're listening to music that was played if it was played by a group, by or with orchestral instruments. You know, instruments you blow through, instruments you bow, instruments that are part of the orchestral family, right? So acoustic instruments. And the way that they are set up with regard to key structure, uh, or, yeah, I'll just say key structure. I could find a better way to say that. It is that they may actually and often actually be playing in a different key than say I would be in order to hear the same notes. And I don't want to entirely get into all the, the, the reasons for that. I mean, it makes sense when, when, when you dig into it. But for example, if I'm playing a B flat on the piano, a trumpet has to play their note C but when they play their note C, it doesn't sound as a C, it sounds as a B flat. So I'm in B flat, they're in C. Now, if you're aware of like the circle of fourths and fifths and sharps and flats, uh, that means on one practical level that they, I am two flats ahead, you know, ahead of them or behind them, and they're two sharps ahead of me. So let's say if I'm in key of C, they're playing the key of D. I would have no accidental or no black keys on the piano, and they would have two. And then an alto saxophone uh, would play their note C, and it would sound as E flat. So they're th three sharps ahead of me, or I'm three flats behind them, or ahead of them, however you want to say it. Uh, so it gets kind of complicated, but what, what it results in is a tendency, not necessarily in classical orchestral music, but in, but in jazz played by orchestral instruments, to lean more on the flat keys and the sharp keys because the other instruments are already several sharps ahead. Uh, I hope that made, made some sense. So. Standards tend to be written in D flat, a few of them, body and soul. E of five flats, which we play in enough, I play in enough that I'm somewhat comfortable. And then a, a flat, which is four flats, B e flat, which is three flats, D e flat, F, C, G, and it kind of stops. Sometimes D, and very rarely A. So, so we have most of our tunes between four flats and one sharp, A flat, D flat, oh no, I put the wrong way, A flat, E flat, B flat, F, C, G, half of the keys. 
Uh, and when you're playing an old standard, you're almost always playing it in one of those keys, with few exceptions. Uh, and when you're playing it instrumentally, and on piano especially, I mean, E flat lays just, just fine. Uh, so, tenderly, E flat, that was the point. But the other point is that we're often flexible with keys uh, when something else matters, like a vocalist. For example, let's see, I think I know one vocalist who sings as time goes by in G. with that and if I wasn't vocalists typically have their own charts you know uh, so I could look at it and get it right and I know someone else who sings in B flat okay. so there's three different keys for as time goes by but stock key is E flat style would be like a, a two-beat ballad. You, know, you, you, you don't feel a walking bass line so much. You don't feel like this. I mean, you could. bass line like it's a swing tune but typically you know, more of a stride feel more of a two beat feel one pa if you you know want to say it right away so when i'm playing that little feel and i think, believe it was uh, last week that i was trying to demonstrate that of the fast tempo was terrible but that was the point to show you that it breaks down for me at fast samples but this Comfortable key, comfortable tempo, uh, the, the the whole bit. Uh, so those older tunes, even if they do walk, you know, uh, often when they're sung the first time through, let's say you're playing in a jazz group where the vocalist sings a tune, then instrumentalists play on the tune, and the vocalist comes back and sings. Uh, Often what will happen is the vocalist will sing and the song will be in two, like I just did. Two meaning, you know, not the walking bass line feel of four, you know, bang, right? Uh, so the vocalist sings in two, but then the rest of the tune is played in four. So that's always discretionary uh, with the musicians and everyone just agrees what's more appropriate for the tune. I was attending a student concert, uh, a, a jazz concert, and it was a tune, I forget what the vocalist was singing, uh, but the bass player didn't get the memo or wasn't instructed or didn't know, I think, you know, knew, knew the jazz, that it really didn't lay right having that ballad sung while the bass was walking. But then when the sax player was soloing after that, yeah, the bass, the bass can walk, it's a different feel. So again... Now I'm still playing on all 
all four beats, put your finger one, dang, ba, 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 do, do, ba, bo, be, ba. Where'd that come from? Oh, welcome to my brain. Whew. All right, so one thing, when I thought about this tune, that I knew I could talk about, and the rest of it I'm just seeing where it goes, which is what I'm doing, uh, is that first phrase uh, that ends in a sigh is still a sigh. Uh, there are 4,000 ways, or at least five, to play sigh. And that's one of the stock ways to do it. When I say ways to play it harmonically, chord choices. Yeah. Another way is... Which is similar, but rhythmically different. Kind of the same chords, but sped up. Instead of... Instead of this... Right, without explaining what the chords are, it's just... Uh, a different rhythmic conception. And then something I like to do which doesn't necessitate being my left hand over, I just did. Which is my second chord in E flat being an A flat dominant. Then if you're familiar with the phrase 2 5 to F. And this is a good example of where my solo piano bubble comes to bite me. Uh, Tenderly is actually an even a better example, uh, since I brought that up. Uh, and, you know, I find the ways I like to play tunes. Uh, and let me have parentheses. You know, this is related to why I'm not a classical performer. Because memorization for me is conceptual, like I'll memorize or remember certain details and then the rest just gets instructed, constructed while I do it, right? which, uh, which makes it interesting uh, for me to play a tune the same way twice. Just like, ooh, it's raining, shiny, right? Did I mention ADD? Uh, I don't know if I did this on camera or not. I don't think I did. But, yeah, I really am trying to memorize note for note, you know, intermediate, easy, classical pieces. And I find that if I don't play them all the time, you know, uh, and first play them thousands of times, there's no way I'm going to make it up, you know. I think I'm close. to happen with, with me. I'm playing with this uh, Bach and Finch. Yeah. Yeah. I've literally played that thing thousands of times and I still went to the wrong note. You know, if I weren't caring about playing the right note, I would have played something and not gone, ah, because I would have done it on purpose. So, uh, so I guess what I'm saying was, I'm just kind of realizing, but it makes sense, that my difficulty in memorizing classical music is related to my difficulty to remember how m musicians typically play certain tunes, especially when I'm playing them more often by myself than with them. And then when you play with, you know, different groups of musicians, it's, it's just like, so, so, so last night at the uh, Stanford Grill gig uh, with Amy and Scott, a Amy calls uh, something the Beatles tune, because we have like an Earl Garner arrangement of that with the Showbert Shires, and Tuesday nights at Stanford Grill is the Showbert Shires minus the Shire, minus Steve F. Shire, so it's the Showberts hold the Shire, right? But what we wind up doing is 
just like reharmonizing some of it and changing the form a little bit to be what Earl Garner did. And now I've done that so many times that I had a gig with Sharon uh, Saturday night and she called something, uh, but more like the Beatles do it, you know, in a different key and the whole bunch because because I have her chart. But still, it's like I don't. Yeah, I can't even begin right now. The whole different feel, different chord changes at, at certain points. So I sort of got back into that just by playing it once. Then when Amy, you know, with her chart. But then when Amy, when Amy called it last night without something in front of me, I was fumbling because it's like, well, I just played it this other way, you know. And I think normal musicians, <laughs> you know, can you know, that would be in my position can keep that straight better than I can. I'm just kind of a creature of the broader conception and, and, and how I'm feeling about it. So what's bringing all this up is my tendency to play, and if you're a musician and you're keeping score here, E flat, A flat, dominant seven, G minor seven, C seven. I'm not sure it's the best way to play it. I'm not even you know, advocating that. It might not be. It probably isn't. But it's just what, where I kind of hear. I want to hear that. And you know why it is? See, I don't necessarily sit down to analyze these thoughts. You know me, I'm, or maybe you don't, but know this, I'm all about, as much as I can pull it off, melodic movement, leading tone movement, connecting chords melodically to the point where what chord they are is really more subject to me about what mel internal melodies I can make. And that's why I like this. side. But the way most people do it, also is a counter melody figure. In fact, you could argue a better one because the, the bass line runs from the, and then when I'm playing as time goes by, sometimes I remember when I'm playing with the rhythm section to do that, and sometimes I forget. And then the bass player like, what? Oh, then the bass player has to adjust to me, you know. But my sense is that I should probably defer to the more common ways to play tunes. But then I don't even necessarily know what they are. They're, they're tunes I seldom play with other people. Does that make any sense? But of course, which I think is the way it's written in the real book, rhythmically. Make me think about it. E flat major, oops, F minor, F sharp diminished, G minor, and when I say minor, minor seven. Uh, but then, but some people play it rhythmic, rhythmically that way. So safe to say that if I'm playing as time goes by with a rhythm section, uh, the first chorus. It's a crapshoot, and this is actually true with a, with a lot of tunes. The first the first chorus is like, okay, what are we doing? What am I doing? And then we figure it out. But then my problem is that when we get to the next chorus, I forget what we figured out. A normal musician can hang on to that, you know. Uh, no, not, not me. Uh, <laughs> So, whenever you're playing any any standard, there is a conundrum, any tune really, there's a conundrum about everybody agreeing on it, especially if they're just people who come together for that moment to play. Now, if you're talking about like a contemporary rock tune or something, that's a different ballgame because 
The construction is simpler uh, and it's really just a set thing and you memorize that set thing and there aren't really alternatives because the harmonic template, the, the palette is different, right? But in the sort of rich vocabulary of the you know, Great American Songbook, you know, you can have, you know, four guys going four different directions, or four musicians, I should say, going four different directions uh, on the same tune, all legitimate directions and all different, meaning it, it will sound cacophonous. And now I'm thinking of the Yogi Bear quote, right? If you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yeah. So, yeah. Talking about stride piano, right? Uh, reference ragtime, because that's where it comes from. Right? And it's single note bass lines, like a tuba. played by a marching band because ragtime is march music. That would be your tuba line. Now when you play ragtime and piano sometimes Scott Chopper will play an octave instead of a single note. Which doesn't change anything because it's a redundant statement just makes it more. Yeah. But most of the time there are single bass notes, sometimes there are octaves, but I'm treating them as if they're the same thing. Okay. Uh, so that simple bass line, uh, and if you're a pianist who wants to practice drag piano, that's what you're going to do. Uh, and that's what you're going to do for a while, or a long time, or period, unless you're really serious about it. Then you work into this other stuff that you do. So, let me just play that simple version of Stride. And I have to hold my left hand back. Wow. I'm struggling to hold my hand back. Was like, uh, it was just, and then like I did it for a bit, and oh, okay, then then, then it clicked. Uh, but another thing that you can do, so if you're playing stride, single notes, roots of chords. Oh, look, I'm playing heart and soul. quoting can be so prevalent because you know there's lots of similarities in chord progressions of tunes right going a different direction and harder direction fewer players will do this and, and 
and I'm like connecting everything in a big open voice. It's like I'm attaching my chord to my bass note and I'm like walking them all. Which is kind of hard to do in this key because it's a big stretch. That's a stretch to do, uh, but different styles of playing stride piano. Whew, let's play the tune again. what I did. I like, kind of loosely hints at it or, or Garner thing, but what that's really about is like the rhythmic dragging. So, or being a little behind. Uh, it's funny, I stumbled across, you know, just it was, came up in my suggestions on YouTube, uh, a tutorial, a jazz tutorial from a site who does them, does really good ones, Open Studio, and the uh, thumbnail video, but the video says, the notes don't matter. And it, meaning, in his case, if the rhythm isn't communicating that feeling, Notes aren't going to matter because the notes aren't going to really say anything. They're just going to be sitting there without organization. And I've talked about that, that, that before. So the serious, you know, professional musician needs to, you know, have this deep sense of feeling. Uh, and it's, there's an epidemic in classical music, among classical music students in particular, of not having that because of the way classical music is, is, is taught. Uh, and, and Lang Lang has the antidote to that. He says, don't just play the note, feel the note. And yeah, we all, we all need to do that. But on the, on the jazz side, you know, it's not just about playing the rhythm right, it's about feeling the groove. In this case, it, it, you can see the beat, I'm like taking the beat and I'm putting the melody like beyond it and late and but it's not wrong, it's just you know, it's layers of feeling as Yeah, everything. 
everything is about feeling, right? It don't mean a thing if it don't feel like swing. That aren't the words, but I like it. <laughs> tune I played it starts here. It's called the bridge of the tune or the B section and in classical theory it would be B uh, and this allows me to bring up the idea of song form which is a classical form. A A B A. Right, so you have an eight bar section typically Same melody. And when two lovers will talk about the bridge of a tune uh, or they see they see someone do this put your nose that's that B section uh, and the B section of a tune typically is nothing like the A section it's a contrasting section and sometimes even changes key to make it really contrasting let's take the tune once in a while first one that comes to mind Closely related to the A, 
and sometimes it's completely different, like like there, different key, different sense of everything. Well, not everything, uh, but some things, and more than none. Uh, it, so the idea of the song form, A-A-B-A, -A -A, which as time goes by is, it's fairly consistent, but sometimes there are exceptions. And, and in one tune, okay, so you talk about how musicians conceptualize tunes. You kind of know going in that with some tunes, you have to ask, how do you do this tune? Like, for example, with uh, I've Got Rhythm. And here's That you, you can ask for anything more. That's called a tag. That actually adds two measures to the tune, to the last A section. That's the kind of thing you would do at the, at the end of a song. But for that tune, it's built into the tune. So the tune is actually not uh, 32 bar, 34. A, A, B, A, two bar tag. And so if you're playing on that rhythm, then somebody asks at some point, if they don't remember in the beginning, they will, when they get past the first chorus, somebody's going to ask, tag every time or no tag? And, and, and most musicians say no tag, but sometimes it's tag every time, which is actually how the tune is written. Another tune that I played both last night and on the gig with Sharon uh, Saturday is Besame Mucho. And I learned something with doing the gig with Sharon, because it was never consistent. Most musicians play it with just one A, it's A, B, A. Is how Sharon sings it, which suggests to me that lyrically there are two A sections if you're going to sing the words. Because seldom do I play it behind a singer. It's usually an instrumental tune, like a Latin feel, you know, if you're playing with an instrumental group, you know, oh, best me mucho, people like that tune. And it's always one A, but not always. You have to ask, one or two A's. And sometimes musicians look at you like, wow, it's always one A, but no, it's not always one A, or it's always two. It isn't always two. Uh, so, again, like remembering what circumstance. And of course, I'm telling you so you can remind me. I'm pointing, it's not the light. That, so when I play it with Amy, it's one A. When I play it with Sharon, it's two A's. So, uh, if, 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 if you're around and somebody calls Besame Mucho, remind me so I don't have to ask because I'll forget. <laughs> and here, here it is with two A's.
thousand as time goes by prompted me to uh, to point out. Uh, I hesitate to say this because I've said this before and it's just ridiculous and makes everybody including me roll their eyes. But this is one of the tunes that uh, Majeri's had a, a big band arrangement of because Paula would sing it. And I think for Paula her key was G and that's why we played it that's where I remember playing it in G with the big band arrangement. You know, and of course it was a popular tune so we did it a lot and Joe would always announce the tune as uh, this is from the movie Casablanca, which translated means House of Blankets. Ugh. Oh. Ow. Ooh. I think... You know what? I should look. Because I have... I'm recording on my phone, but I have my other phone here. Uh... I'm going to look while I'm talking on YouTube, and I'm going to see if Finger uh, Madiri, D I R I, the Finger Bussin' CD, it's a D U, do, 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 is, yeah, it is. Uh, so let's see. No, actually. Oh, it is, it is all posted. Okay, so go to As Time Goes By on the Finger Bustin CD, okay? It is a really nice arrangement. And actually, this, this could orchestrate something, too. And of course, these aren't good speakers, it's just my phone. Yes, Jay. Yeah, let's stop that for a second, All right? So, uh, when you have any tune, and right now we're talking about as time goes by, when a tune is performed, you wind up orchestrating it. You wind up arranging it. Uh, and if you're a solo pianist like me, that arrangement kind of happens on the spot when you're improvising. But for me, the arrangement takes on an orchestral quality. Uh, because I'm approaching the piano as an instrument, which is, it is, that has the ranges of all the orchestral instruments. So everything you heard there, although you didn't really hear it loudly, but listen to it on your own, all the little figures, all the little lines, the sax is playing behind Paul and everything, that's all playable on the piano. Now, because there are like 10, 11 different instruments going, it might not be possible for one solo pianist at one time to play every note there, but you could you could get close to it, right? Uh, and that becomes an arrangement. And then when you have more instruments, like a big band, you know, you can do that. And there's all sorts of like wonderful, beautiful ways you can arrange a tune. And uh, in fact, this little figure that the saxophonist just did, I'm going to play in my usual way. Do, 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 you do, do. Okay, this little nice little line there, and that was related to. I think it did it that way. That you know, so decision was made like what harmony to use, and then melodies were written on that underneath the vocal. You know, so if, if you like big band music, uh, pay attention to the arrangements. Listen to what goes on in the internal parts. Like, you know, Glenn Miller was a great arranger. Uh, I'm not sure whose arrangement this is in the Madiri band. It might be Gene Rizzo's, who, who, who was their piano player for, for, for a long while. Uh, but then Joe and Paul have also arranged some of the tunes. Uh, and I just really like the saxophone solo on this. So it's played by a tenor sax player, Wendell Hobbs, who passed away just, I think, within the last year uh local local to my regional area that made no sense local to my regional area you know like i would say local but in my little rural place local means like in a town of five thousand people i think wendell Hobbs was from wilmington so in, in nearby uh but uh it also goes to uh 
just illustrate that there are fabulous musicians all over the place that, you know, you're not going to know their names and they're out there grinding it out and they're, you know, being the, the sax players in, 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 in a big band recording, which were all guys who came in. They actually wasn't his regular sax section. There's a reason for it. Uh, and he brought in uh, essentially studio guys who came in and aced, aced that book. I was, I was first thinking when we, we did that, it was 99, I think, I said, Joe, what are you doing? You, you, you're not going to use your regular sax guys who uh, have played these things a million times and all have radar and everything? And oh my goodness, you know. Uh, so yeah, that's a tune that everybody's played. So, boy, was that all over the place, but maybe you get something out of it. <laughs> thought about this or any tune you know a tune's a vehicle you know it's it, it's it's a delivery system for for musicians in my camp and a tune's a tune right a tune's a tune oh my goodness i should talk about christmas tunes sometime this month yeah uh and i'm not one of these guys who's oh that tune oh yeah you know i hate that tune a lot of guys will do do that. It's a tune's a tune, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I like playing Christmas tunes, but 
That's not what I'm talking about today. Did I mention ADD? So anyway, I hope you got something out of this. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for your support. Thanks for your encouragement. And I hope to see you soon, maybe tomorrow night for Piano for My Friends. Thanks a lot.